Hello, Nathan Isaac. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, could you give us a brief biography of yourself, please? Yeah, man. And thanks for having me on the show. Uh, um, yeah, I'm Nathan Isaac. Uh, I am the the one of the, the main things I've been doing for the last few years is uh, a penny roll. So I'm the host and producer of uh, the penny roll podcast. Um, but, uh, you know, researcher, uh, writer of weird weird stuff um and uh yeah I, i've done uh, quite a bit of like uh you know film and uh some music production and stuff like that um, here in kentucky i'm located in somerset kentucky uh and one of the you know, what, what i think is one of the weirdest places in the world uh, <laughs> and uh yeah just been researching all of the the high strangeness in kentucky but it's kind of widened out into a lot of other uh, stories and narratives that um, they're all interlinked. And like, like we were just talking before we got on here, all, all this stuff is so like strangely interconnected, you know? <laughs> yeah. It was, so what to someone new to all of this, what is the Penny Royal? Like what it, it's a piece of geography, isn't it? So could you sort of uh, describe what that is? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, you know, the show uh, is, the, the the byline of the show is the the magic and mystery of place right and uh, a big part of the research a big part of the show was and, and is looking at uh, the sort of the genius loci or the spirit of place and and how people and landscape and place are tied together right and influence each other uh, so the that all really the, the looking into that and the research into that sort of concept really for me started with the Penny Royal, right? Which is this area of Kentucky uh, here in the United States that uh, it's called the Penny Royal Plateau. And it stretches from uh, in Western Kentucky where the Mammoth Cave cave system is, which is the largest cave system in the world. And so from that cave system, there's this uh, plateau in south central uh kentucky basically and uh it stretches all the way to the appalachian mountains in the east uh and yeah it's it's a strange place the other the other thing that's that's interesting about the penny roll plateau is that it really tracks with uh this anomaly uh that nasa refers to as the kentucky anomaly which that that also was sort of why this all became um uh, an investigation and sort of a project that was looking into place, right? Uh, because this place, you know, Somerset, which is really right, right on the, uh, the sort of the heart of the Penny Roll Plateau. It's also the, the right at the center of NASA's mapping of this weird geomagnetic spike, right? Which is uh, supposedly according to NASA is the largest spike of geomagnetic, you know, fields uh, out of the earth's uh, core, you know, they don't know why they, they think there's some mass underneath Kentucky here, you know, that that's causing it. But, um, but yeah, so that's, that's sort of the region. It's, it's like a weird triangle of sorts. Um, mm -hmm. And where we are too, it, it borders along the uh, Daniel Boone National Forest, which is this huge, you know, 700,000 acre forest where nobody really lives. And uh, there have been tons and tons of Bigfoot sightings, UFO sightings, you know, lots of weird occult shit too, you know, so. Mm. Have you ever, there was a fictional podcast that came out recently called Tannis. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Tannis yeah. seems to have a, it's almost like a fictional penny royal, isn't it? In some, in yeah. some cases. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, there's, so another, there's, a, there's another podcast out of uh, Kentucky too, uh, Old Gods of, of Appalachia. And oh. they get some of the, uh, it's fictional, it's a fictional podcast, but they, they get into some of the Lovecraftian elements and kind of place them in Appalachia. But um, I think a lot of that, you know, it all, you know, so it's a lot of Twin Peaks vibes, <laughs> you know what I mean, to the to all of this, all that kind of stuff, you know. So there's definitely a rise in like Grant seems to be. I mean, we talk about this a lot on the show. Grant seems to be having a kind of renaissance at the moment. Wait, well, it's not even really a renaissance. He wasn't particularly popular before, but now he's he is sort of becoming quite popular. And I'm seeing all these other writers pop up where they're talking about Lovecraft being this, you know, someone that channeled rather than created, if that makes sense. Uh, it's, yeah, it's an, have you come up on, on that as well? Yeah, man. Well, you know, as a kid too, like I remember 
uh, you know, to sort of date myself. I remember 1992 when the internet really, <laughs> really started. Where at least here in the U.S., where it was like you could get on, you could go to the local library and get on a, you know, a computer. Uh, people didn't have them really in their homes, or at least we didn't, you know, in Eastern Kentucky. And uh, uh, and I'm from like a super small rural town in in the Appalachian Mountains, right? And uh, uh, I remember going to to the library and using it to get on the internet and finding the Necronomicon, right? And as a kid, I was like, "Oh, this is this is crazy!" And then discovering Lovecraft, and then figuring out that the Necronomicon was bullshit, right? It's not, you know. <laughs> but then later, the controversy of whether or not it was real, the whole Simon thing, right? And uh, uh, but just just this idea that like old the old ones and and all of the, the whole lovecraftian mythos right the cthulhu mythos stuff just that i i, I loved it it's, it was like obviously it's foundational sort of like the beginning of horror you know as a genre and all this stuff but um but then when i started researching all the penny royal stuff especially here and then we it, it crossed over with the daniel boone national forest the bait cabal uh, Kenneth Grant and the Typhonian Order stuff, but especially with the Bait Cabal, right? They were that were coming down here from Cincinnati uh, in the 1970s. It's like when you read the Cincinnati Journal of uh, Ceremonial Magic that they, uh, you know, uh, published in the 1970s, which had a lot of uh, Nema Maggie Ingalls uh, writings. Like they, f- they f- for real believe, you know, that there were these old ones. They weren't necessarily like tentacled, you know, horrors or anything, but that there were these, you know, extra dimensional beings, intelligences that were trying to pe- penetrate our dimension. And that there was, uh, I guess, the Adina and the Hopewell and some of these, uh, some Native American groups had uh, opened a portal right over top of the Daniel Boone National Forest, that area, right? And uh, and called it the Cincinnati Vortex. And like it really when you read the publication and 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 see some of like the stories surrounding those groups, it's like they really were trying to close the port. They were were really doing these kinds of rituals and things and, and had legitimate belief that there were these these uh, intelligences out there. So for me it was just kind of funny because it was like, well shit is is this fake you know is this real or right. these people at least believe this is real right mm-hmm. um and so that was just them as well. and, and i and i'm not like a you know i i had no prior familiarity with it, magic or ceremonial magic right um so that's all been eye-opening for me to kind of delve into that world and and to, to the OTO, all of those things, you know, have, have been very, very new to me, very new to a, a guy growing up in rural Kentucky, you know. <laughs> well, I remember when I was in the OTO, um, Grant was always a bit of a joke, actually. He, like, you know, it's like, he's not real, Philema, like, you know, he took over the OTO and he, well, he, he you know, ran the OTO for a while in the UK um, and was kind of kicked out for trying to introduce the Lovecraft stuff into into the you know um the core rituals of the ato but uh the last couple of years it's like he just pops up over and over and over and over again in things and he's really sort of you know um if you go to like bookshops here in the uk there's just always kind of grant books there now really? that wasn't the case a few years nah. ago yeah that's funny um, well i mean I've ended up buying a bunch of Kenneth Grant books, obviously for the research and stuff, but it's like whoever owns his estate has gotten a lot of my money. <laughs> yeah. 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 Starfire. Um, yeah. I mean, that Michael Staley has done a great job getting them all back out again. It's like, it's amazing. You know, considering like how few people are involved with that, like the amount of work he's done. So it, it's crazy, but there's all these other, there was another, we had another guy on the show recently, Muller, um, Wolfgang Muller, who wrote a book called Polaria. And that's a, another book completely unrelated to Kenneth Grant saying the same thing, that saying that Lovecraft's, uh, you know, uh, his characters, his fiction was channeled through dreams. And, you know, and there's this crazy story. I was, I need to sort of get a proper quote on it, but there's a story where Lovecraft's talking about, there's a character called Nalath Hotep. He's this kind of, um, mm-hmm. you, you probably know who he is. He's kind of yeah. like this, he kind of appears in various stories and yeah. he's like this sort of dark figure. But apparently he he received that in a dream where a friend came running up to him saying, stay away from the fair or something. Um, there's a man there called Nala Fotep. It's like, oh, man. <laughs> it's like, that's, that's a, yeah. I mean, it, it definitely pings my, my, my occult knowledge off a little bit. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> it, is, it is interesting. I'll have to look that guy. I'm, I'm not familiar with that, that book. 
the book, I mean, the book is super rare. We um, There's a PDF. I'll send you the PDF. There's a PDF oh. floating around of it. But if you want to buy it new, at the, or if you want to buy it used, rather, on Amazon at the moment, there's a copy for £1,700. So, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> he needs to reprint that thing, I think. But, uh, he, <laughs> yeah, because it's the, the PDF isn't great. Um, let's talk about the anomaly in Penny Royal because the, um, it's something to do with quartz, isn't there? And um, that kind of interests me. Yeah, so that that's the other aspect of like the region and, and what what I found to be interesting. And and again, I was never any I wasn't into like say crystals or or that type of um, you know sort of magic that involved crystals or charging crystals. But um, definitely when you know we started looking at this, there's a huge concentration of quartz here in Kentucky, especially where the Penny Roll Plateau is, right? And uh, quartz is also like the the state rock of Kentucky, right? <laughs> which I think is funny, you know, um, but, but this area has all this quartz here. And um, if you go down to any of the streams here, you're going to, if you wade into the stream, you're just going to find thousands and thousands of these uh, crazy, you know, quartz geodes, right? They're everywhere. These like crazy rounded rocks um, and people collect them. Our house is built. It has tons of uh, quartz, rocks that people brought up from the river to, to build the house. Right. That was, was kind of strange thing when we moved here to this farm. Um, but tons of quartz everywhere. And, and, and when we started looking into penny rollers, there's like a lot of, uh, violence that seems to be in bloodshed that this like a history of violence that this place has Pulaski County, right. In Somerset, uh, where I am in Kentucky. And, uh, we were looking at that and we were like, this is, it's, it was just strange that there were so many stories and so many like really, really violent things. Um, and some were like tied into some weird ritualistic stuff, but courts, you know, was concentrated here. And then looking at the Kentucky anomaly and this huge spike of geomagnetic sort of energies, um, you know, the whole concept of the piezoelectric effect popped up. Right. And there, there's been tons of research done by, you know, universities in Japan, I think in Brazil, like lots of different places have, uh, in universities have, uh, researched high quartz content with, uh, magnetic anomalies and the effect that it's had on people that live in those places. Right. And they've reported, you know, higher incidences of, you know, psychological disorders, uh, you know, high, the, the reason they were re researching in Japan was that there were higher incidences of suicide in areas where, um, there was a lot of quartz and these sort of, uh, geomagnetic anomalies. So, uh, that, so that became sort of a thing that, uh, that that we really became obsessed with and looking into was was tracking sort of the effect that this had on people and uh, you know like one of the crazy like one of the craziest stories that I that I always tell people about the place uh, because I think it has you know spatial effects I don't you know I don't know I mean obviously the things it's just weird um, and and whether or not it, like people are seeing more ufos in this area right because of the effect was and, and that's honestly how i ended up even looking at uh the kentucky anomaly stuff was you know there was a there was a blog that had mentioned the kentucky anomaly and uh and i was at the time this was like 2012 i was looking at sedona arizona right and um sedona at the time was the the place to be if you wanted to see a ufo right in the u.s for some reason, there was just this crazy number of, of sightings there. And obviously, Sedona was like a really big spiritual place. Uh, and But underneath the town, I got to visit there f just a few years ago after I found all this stuff out. And I, I really wanted to go and see it for myself. But there's quartz underneath the town, like huge deposits of quartz, right? And it like sticks, sticks up out of this red desert. And they have this real, it's the second largest spike of geomagnetic uh energy in the U in the u.s right the third one is in southern alaska and <laughs> there's some weird stuff up there too so but i was looking at that and that's what that honestly looking at sedona and seeing the correlation between the quartz and the geomagnetism caused me to really go deep into you know finding this the kentucky anomaly research that nasa had put out um but yeah so that there seems to be some correlation between uh, the quartz and the geomagnetism. But the the story I was going to tell you that that happened is that my wife, who is not into any of this weird stuff, right, at all, she uh, 
uh, had an experience. We lived at downtown Somerset in a house and she'd come out of the bathroom one day and t- in, t- in the middle of the day, not at night, had just finished like taking a shower, came out and there's a thermostat on our wall. And it like, she said that it slid across the wall down and then bounced back into place. But she, I mean, honestly thought that she was like having a, like a, psychological episode or so you know what i mean like something was wrong she freaked out but she didn't think paranormal or anything like that and then you know told me about it and i was like this that's strange but two years later the same thing happened again and i and i talked to a lot of people in this area and people that weren't really reporting paranormal incidences would still tell me stories where it was like something had floated off the shelf and fallen in the middle of the room right and that was it they never had any other occurrence. There were no ghosts in their house. That was the only thing that ever happened, right? Uh, and there were a lot of, of stories that of think strange things like that, uh, especially in some downtown Somerset. So, um, so then I, I just began to wonder if there was some some weird weird effect. Also, just because of the weird concentration of people, like back to the baker balls and stuff, and the whole Cincinnati vortex. Like it's weird that Nima. And Grant were writing about all that stuff in this area, right? That there's this portal and that's actually where the Kentucky anomaly is. And that, that research wasn't out until 82, right? So mm. what, what were they talking about the same thing? What, what, is there, you know, is there a correlation between the Kentucky anomaly and these occult writings about a portal in this area? You know? Yeah. There's something definitely to, like locations i mean even in, even in certain films if you sort of use a location a certain way it can have this weird resonant effect on the viewer kind of thing i mean lynch is very good at that and mm. um there's a there's a lot of it's hard to explain it's almost like a stone tapey kind of thing isn't it like yeah. there's like a i don't know have you have you looked into the whole stone tape theory i don't know yeah, and i mean I, I wonder like you know is the lands i mean that's the th- that's the thing that we consider right and and I mean, like, just personally, I, I wonder if that's true about a lot of places, right? But can you encode these events into the landscape, right? And do they play out continuously? I mean, that's really the the third season of Penny Roll goes deep into that because I think, and this is you know part of the the continuing investigation into this, is that there was an older tradition here, like something did happen here. Someone was doing something. Uh, and, and somehow that has not infected the land, but been absorbed by the land, right. Or sort of sublimated by the land. And so like it, certain people maybe are psychically more predisposed to being affected by it, you know? Uh, and, and I, and I wonder if it isn't, you know, if, if geomagnetism, if some of these energies, right. That, that. Uh, science maybe doesn't think has an effect does in fact have an effect, right? That does leave some resonances, right? And, and they're activated. Some people activate them and they're playing out these rituals. It's like the whole psychodrama, uh, you know, sort of like a ritualistic psychodrama that they don't know that they're participating in. And that's not active. It's not like there's an active intelligence, right? Guiding these people, but it's like the landscape itself, is playing that out over and over again because it's whatever happened embedded itself, you know. Mm. It's 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 almost like there's like a feedback loop going on, isn't there? Like a kind of, like when people kind of get involved with a place, it it, it seems to make it even more powerful and, you know, you get this kind of loop going on. (laughs) It's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's mad. One of the things we've been looking at is this kind of primordial magic kind of stuff. There's this kind of magic that predates, um, uh, we were talking about it a little bit earlier. Um, this kind of idea that there's a, you know, if you trace back Crowley, you trace back the Golden Dawn, you can kind of, you get to a certain point, but you, you don't really, um, what am I trying to say here? You kind of don't, it's hard to try and find the source of it all, <laughs> if that makes sense. And I start to wonder with, if all this stuff is somehow connected. You know, there's this kind of primordial magic that's kind of somehow connected to the land and we just haven't noticed it yet or something, you know, there's, <laughs> does that make sense at all? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, totally. I think there's, uh, yeah, yes. Uh, uh, there's some, I mean, there's some great, um, back in the seventies, the sixties and the seventies, there were all those, uh, you know, researchers in England that were, uh, looking at the landscape and, 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 um, I can't think of the couple's name right now that, uh, published the book. 
is it called the secret country? Um, it's an old oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, sort of like ley lines. I forget the name, the name of the couple, but, um, but they were going around England and uh, uh, the UK and were like digging up old traditions that were related to the standing stones. Right. And uh, they talk a lot about the churches moved by night. Have you heard of that before? Where it's like they were building churches on pagan uh, like pagan areas. Like the church was reclaiming the pagan sites, right? Yeah. And yeah. they were trying to to build a church there. So like when they would start building the churches, the workers would go to sleep. The next day they would come back and all of everything that they had done had been moved to another site, right? Uh, in an impossible amount of time. And so they'd redo everything come back the next morning, it would, it was moved again. Right. And it was this whole idea of like churches moved by nights. And finally they just ended up building the church where it's moved to. Right. And it's as if there were intelligences or the landscape itself was affecting where, where things had to be and, and, and embedded in it. And so, uh, uh, I just, uh, and then there's, there's just tons of these, these theories of like, not just the ley line stuff, but of, uh, fire lanes. There's some, the 40 and times has a ton of great articles of these researchers in the 1970s, um, that were looking at specific areas of, uh, you know, England and why, there were weird things concentrated right in those places. And then they would trace the whole history of it. And it would go all the way back to some like weird primordial, <laughs> primordial thing sort of. Um, yeah. I, I, I definitely think that there, it, there's something, man. I, I just, it, it just always seems to harken back to something older. Like you keep going back, you think you're going to find like it was this guy or this group or, you know, that, that, that did this, but you just, it keeps going further back, you know, that those people were just part of the cycle. Right, part of that loop. One one of those sort of places where, I mean, ley lines were uh, were mentioned there. Like um, there was another book written. I can never remember the name of the book now, but it was like, about this energy source. But there's a town just north of here called East Grinstead, um, and East Grinstead is like this hub of like <laughs> crazy stuff. So back in the sort of late '90s, early 2000s, there were a lot of groups there. Um, a lot of them, yeah. They, they seem to have a lot of money. They had these big manor houses and you drive past them and you see these gates with symbols on them. And But it's also where Ron Hubbard um, based Scientology. And it's like... What? There's, there's a, yeah. So it's, um, he moved to East Grinstead. It's a manor hill. It is the... Um, it's you know it's the it's the center of Scientology. Well, the original center of Scientology. It's uh, where, where he was based, <laughs> and uh, yeah. So you have this town that just seems to sort of draw in all these kind of. It seems to be it's a bit like the Penny Royal thing. It's kind of these areas that just seem to draw in these people. And there's you know if you go there, I was there recently and was just going for a walk with my partner, and she was like, "What are these guys doing?" And we went up and spoke to them, and they they were doing ley line searching you know they were tracing the ley lines and we we're like okay that's uh, that's still happening here and yeah well i was I, I, I do think i mean you're like there are like those places like that that they really do draw people to them for some really like that's the thing it's like why 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 do they have these like clusterings of like we we say strange people but they're just i mean <laughs> you know but it's like it's it's crazy right yeah, no, it's it's, and you, it, there's certain places you go to. I mean, the, we were talking before as well. We're doing a bit of an investigation ourselves at the moment into an area down the road, and it, you just go there and you you get. I know this almost sounds a bit woo woo, but you get this sort of feeling there, and you notice things there that are just different. <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain. Like so, one of the places, the woodland I was telling you about. You go there, you go to certain areas of that wood, and you sound just stops. There's no uh, wildlife at all you just like what like you step back a few meters and you can hear birds you step forward a few meters and nothing it's the weirdest thing <laughs> it's like the strangest thing and we've been out there with microphones recording this and just sort of ex you know as an example going like here you can you can hear birds in the background dogs in the background whatever you go to this part and it's no sound no shit, <laughs> it's the weirdest yeah. thing yeah it's really bizarre so that, yeah so i'm totally down with this idea that certain areas have kind of some sort of magnetic appeal to weird stuff happening around them and yeah, yeah it's uh, <laughs> was it was it a uh, paul Devereux? was the he's written a bunch of stuff um researcher from like the 
in England from like the uh, 70s and 80s or 60s, 70s, 80s. But he wrote a bunch of stuff about this, you know, about place and and uh, uh, he wrote wow. about that place. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah, it's um, it's 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 strange, isn't it? I don't know. I find it. So have you actually yourself had any experiences where in the area? I mean, I've had um, there's been a lot of like. I guess I would say I've had a crazy clustering of like synchronicities, you know, like not, not necessarily. I mean, I've, we've, we've seen a lot of like strange things and had some like sightings of, of stuff and lights and stuff in the area, but like, it's been more just like, I don't know, like the way that there are these weird recurrences right in in the area, you know? Um, And, other, I mean, definitely other people have seen lots of stuff, but I, I haven't had, I haven't had like a direct encounter with anything. I would say, you know, uh, uh, here I've had other ca- encounters, you know, prior, you know, but it was more like, I, I guess, like once the show came out, there was a weird thing where like the these signs appeared all over town, right? Uh, and someone had climbed on top of a roof and spray paint. And this was like a day after the podcast came out, right? The first season. And people had climbed up on top of a roof of a house and wrote all over it, spray painted. And it's like, right as you drive into Somerset, it said, this town is a cult. And (laughs) went in this like whole, like all this crazy shit. And, uh, and then they had made signs and they were putting them up around town. Right. And they were like weird, weird signs about how this is the Truman show. None of this is real. Started talking MK ultra stuff, you know? And, uh, and so we talked to the cops because where the studio was, some people had like knocked a door down and then wrote some of this stuff. And it turned out that it was someone that they knew. They knew who had done all this stuff. They even knew who had spray painted the stuff on top of the, the building. But, um, and, uh, and that person had committed a lot of crime, uh, apparently a lot of crimes, but it was like, it was weird that, that that had happened and coincided with some of the stuff that we had found. Then like a weird, uh, apocalyptic preacher showed up from California. <laughs> right. And, uh, started a website and was trying to start a cult. Like, this is all like in the wake of, of the show coming out. Right. So that, that was, you know, it was like strange stuff like that being at the mine and we were, you know, one of the craziest, one of the craziest things that happened, right. Is that we were at the mine and I was filming a promo for the show, uh, to put out. And I'd convinced like, uh, like 13 or 14 people to come with me up there. And I bought all these purple robes, right. And had commissioned, uh, this artist that I knew to, to make this like six foot tall mirror pyramid. And we took it out there and I was filming like a, a an actual, like, video promo for the podcast and we're out in the middle of nowhere. It's this Mount victory mine that's near where sort of like the peak of the anomaly is. And you're out like eight, 10 miles on a, on a road where nothing else is out there. Right. And mm-hmm. all of a sudden I've got all these people there. Uh, one of the researchers that, that appears in the show, Steven Snyder, he was driving my uh, vehicle, my truck, so that I could film driving down the road and he backed the vehicle over a cliff, right. And jammed it into between a couple of trees. And so we're all standing there. We're trying to get the, the, the truck unjammed. Everyone's standing around in purple robes. And that's when these headlights come on, right. Coming down the road. And this guy pulls up and he's like, jumps out. And I'm like, Oh my God, you know, he's going to see all these people, you know, in robes. And, uh, he gets out and he's like, well, watch out. You know, there's, there's, there's snakes there. And I'm, he's just, there's a snake nest. And I was like, there's no snakes. We drove the car over there. If there's a snake there, you know, they've, they've, they've run off. He, 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 I finally calmed the guy down. He like drives the throw, turns around, comes back, gets back out and says, hey, come over here, come over here. He gets me over to the back of his truck and he has all these plastic tubs. And he opens up the tubs and there's all these snakes inside the tubs. Right. And he was going and catching snakes to sell to the snake handling churches here, right? The Pentecostal churches, like the Holy Rollers. And he thought we were a fucking church or like some type of religious group out in the woods with these robes on and was trying to sell me snakes, right? And I was like, 
what the fuck is, you know? So those kinds of things kept, you know, happening. There were just like a lot of weird, especially in terms of the way that things have personally connected us um, that are less, like less easy to describe those, those kinds of, of st- just, just weird. You know, you feel like something strange happened and uh, things were like get down to the bottom of my driveway and I start to turn left and there's a car sitting there empty with all the doors open, right? And a little bright bicycle that had been broken. And my neighbor pulls out, we're, I'm on my way to work. And uh, my neighbor's like, uh, should we call the cops? I'm like, yeah, we need to call the sheriff's department. You know, somebody's abandoned a car in the road. Sheriff, the sheriff's deputy comes. He's like, it's all cool. We'll make it go away. It's just like, that was it, man. You know, and just like <laughs> weird, you know, just weird, weird things like that. Uh, that I've that that happened here, at least to me, you know, I haven't had any, I I've, I've haven't been lucky enough to have like a black Panther sighting or anything. There's tons of people that talk about the sightings of the alien black cats uh, in, in this region, which, which is something I think, think is tied to, you know, sort of, you know, in, in England, definitely there, 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 there are no large black cats, but there are tons and tons of sightings of those, uh, those black cats and, the same thing here in Kentucky. And I think there's an association between certain places and anomalies and those things existing in those areas. Right. And that's like the, of, of the, the one thing that I have reported more than anything, you know, all the people that I've interviewed in this area about folklore and stories and try to collect those stories. That's the thing that is like the most common is that they've mm-hmm. seen this giant black Panther, you know, and uh, and of course, there there are no black pan- panthers here. You know, I often wonder if you're like looking into things, like that. There's this kind of trickster element almost that kind of stops allowing you to see or experience these things, and it's making it doubly hard to actually track down things. I, I've often had this thought, like when I've looked into things myself, like it's like you think, well, are these guys all making it up or is there something going on, like some force that's trying to stop me from, right. you know? Yeah. And it's like, and I often wonder if magic, like ceremonial magic is a way around that. It's like a way of kind of, um, you know, uh, unclogging that kind of block <laughs> a little bit, because I've often found when I'm looking into something, if there's some sort of magic going on in my life or some kind of ceremonial stuff going on in my life, it suddenly becomes a lot easier to see it. Oh, really? Or, yeah. Yeah. That's kind of interesting. So I often wonder if, I mean, Greenfield kind of talks about that, doesn't he? He talks about how kind of, um, you know, occult rituals seem to like make UFO things happen and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Well, and-, well, and that's what I think, you know, for me, uh, like looking into this stuff uh, that happened in the Penny Royal region, right? It, it all, a lot of it goes back to the 1970s. Like when I look at, like the place has always been strange and there are a lot of like strange occurrences prior to the 1970s, but it's like in the 1970s, that's the, that's like when the clustering happens, right? It like starts and like it's, it seems like something was set into motion at that time. Now, whether or not it was, I don't know, but, 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 but I do wonder that like, are, have people done rituals right in this area? And it's like, because they did that magic, it started these sort of loops, right? And that's what we're interacting with, you know, in, in finding all these weird things and having these synchronicities. It's like, did the magic sort of, you know, set things in motion that are unseen, right? Or affect things and, and, and those things have sort of snowballed or spiraled out uh, through time, mm. right? Um and, that, and that's the thing too, you know, the, the bait cabal, some of the stuff involved, uh, you know, in Bertio, uh, and some of his magic, the time magic, right. That's something I've never even considered to, you know, as a reality, but yet there are people that believe that's a reality and they put these rituals where it's, uh, you're, you're working outside of time and space and it gets back to the whole Kenneth Grant stuff and, and, mm-hmm. uh, some of the Typhonian well, words. There was a crossover there, wasn't there, with Bertio and Kenneth Grant. They, uh, I can't remember which book Bertio first gets mentioned in, but he it's early yeah. on. I know that mm-hmm. Grant was a, a fan of, of Bertio. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, no, it's interesting. So there's a couple of characters I find really interested in, in Penny Royal. The first one's the guy that's making a, or made an opera to Pan. Is, this, is that right? Is it opera oh, to Pan or like? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Could you talk a little uh, bit about that guy? Because that whole thing's really interesting. 
The it, it, in the second season, um, uh, the, I think in the first season, isn't it? There's a guy oh. you're talking to. Oh, is it Greg uh, with Hillier? Greg Newkirk? No, no, no. It's um, there's a guy that's uh, is it an opera or is it like a sort of performance of Pan? And you were going to make oh, a film with him? Oh, Dan Dutton. Dan Dutton. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. A, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Dan's an interesting character. I just saw Dan last night. Um, he uh, is a really well-known Kentucky artist here. That, yeah, I guess that if I had to say what's what's strange, what the strangest thing that's happened to me, right? I would say this is is one of the biggest like moments where you're like, what the fuck's going on? But like, uh, um, Dan and I had been met a, a decade ago, and uh, we've been working together. He's a really famous Kentucky artist, right? Uh, back in the early nineties, uh, he did a series of dance operas, uh, that were called the secret, secret Commonwealth, right? So Kentucky's the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And so he did this, uh, these dance operas and called it the secret Commonwealth to sort of connect it to the whole book on fairies. Right. And, uh, that there was this, this sort of fairy tale and it goes through this, uh, four part operatic cycle. And they, they filmed that for like PBS here in the United States and it was on TV. Like it was a, it was a pretty big deal. And, um, so anyway, he and I started working together and, and, uh, I started recording a lot of his stories and, and making some art with him. And, um, through the course of that, he had mentioned that after he finished this whole secret Commonwealth, uh, uh, movement you know through those four parts had taken like 12 years of his life he decided to like take a break and um and so like taking a break was making another opera right and so (laughs) so the other opera that he made was about pan right and um and he called it the fawn and so very small dance opera and he was doing doing a travel log uh, in Eastern Kentucky, the state of Kentucky had hired him because he was a well-known artist to take a camera and to drive the roads of Eastern Kentucky. And we're going to turn this into sort of a tourism uh, advertisement. So they paid him to, to go on this trip. He decided to go to a, a Elkhorn city, right? Along the way. And he tells me the story. It's just like, Oh yeah, I had this weird thing happen to me, you know? And, and as, as so often when people are like, when you say, has anything strange happened to you? They're like, no, but then they tell you a story and then it's like, that's strange. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> but, uh, he, he went to Elkhorn city and he had, he lost his car on the way. There were these like weird fairy elements to it, like trickster elements where, you know, he stopped halfway there in this, this, uh, small town and uh, in Whitesburg and then loses his car. And it's like, after that, it's like he went down the rabbit hole. He ends up in Elkhorn city and has this crazy experience. We, we tell the whole story in um, episode four of season one. And he thinks that he's had this psychological experience where he encounters the embodiment of pain. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and Dan, so much of Dan's work from the beginning in, in like 1979 forward involves pain. And so he sort of like built his life around devotion to the idea of pan, right. As an, as an artistic muse. And so there's tons of like on his property, which is an art farm, right. With all these sculptures and everything. It's called Dandyland. Um, He, he has all these, you know, there's statues of pan. And, and uh, so he and I started working on a a documentary about his relationship to pan. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you know, the Hellier TV show came, came to Somerset, uh, because a woman here had messaged, uh, Greg Newkirk and Dana Newkirk about a cult being here. Right. And so, uh, in the second season of their show, Hellier, they came to Somerset and they interviewed me and, and, but we didn't talk about pan or anything like that. Right. And we talked a lot about the Kentucky anomaly stuff and, and the crime rate and all the weird, uh, like ritualistic murders here and they left and that was that. And like a year later, the show comes out. Right. And when, the, when the show came out, uh, at the end of the second season of Hellier, they make an, the whole pan thing becomes a major part. Right. And, and there was this element. So like that day, uh, that we see it come out, I messaged Greg Newkirk and I was like, dude, you know, you, this show's about pan. Like, 
Dan Dutton has a whole opera, you know, it's called the fawn. And he's like, I'm looking at Dan Dutton's picture on my wall right now. Right. We just didn't include him. He's, he's not mentioned in the second season. So it was like, that was a weird intersection, right. That they had picked up on this uh, energy of like pan that was involved in all of that. And, and so, and, and pan really, you know, pan has had like a, a rebirth, in the last, uh, you know, few years, which is kind of strange, I think is, is an odd element to all of this. Dan thinks that it's, that it is an, an energy, you know, I mean, in his life, like, you know, he still is doing a lot of work, you know, a lot of sculptures, a lot of pieces. Uh, I have a ton of Dan's work here and it's all, you know, the fawn, right. You know, all of these, these, these sculptures and things. And so it's like, it's an, it's an energy or, or, or a, a concept that that's really, uh, been present here in this area. I want, but even with that, it's like, is it Dan, right? Is Dan the one that's sort of the conduit for that energy that maybe someone is, is interacting with or, or is it, you know, something I wonder a lot about is like how much of this is retroactive, right? Like, is, is there an anomaly here? Is this stuff here? But it's like our interaction with what we see as a narrative that stretches back in time. Is it our interaction with that that's causing it to happen, right? Are we sort of interacting with our own actions now looking at it like as, an, as observers, right? In this sort of weird feedback loop. It's like our observing of it now is causing it to happen in the past almost, you know what I mean? Which is mm. causing us to interact with it now. Um, I don't know. I just, it's, it's weird. The whole thing's so strange, man. The whole, like, once you, like, once you start looking into this stuff, there really is this, it's like, it takes, it could only be what it is. If you yourself are the one that's looking at it, right. Mm -hmm. If someone else were to interact with it, it would be a totally different thing for them. But it's like the people that are observing it, it it takes a part of you and then it feeds it back. You know, it's like, it, it takes a part of you, I think. And, and and that's what it's showing you, you know. I think Waga, Eric Wage talks a little bit about that kind of stuff, like retro retro causality. I think yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah. It's kind yeah. of interesting. That's it's interesting how the quantum stuff seems to interlink with magic a lot of the time as well. <laughs> that's kind of uh, interesting. Would you? I mean, would you think? Would you agree that like because you know, with from my like limited knowledge of like ceremonial magic, I mean, isn't in many ways magic is like building synchronicities and then stacking those synchronicities until the effect that you want ha happens. Right. Mm -hmm. In a sense, yeah. like creating those little loops that become bigger loops and then boom, here's, this is where I, what I wanted to have it, but I had to, to really focus my will and, and, and cause that to happen, but through those like stacked synchronicities. Mm, so yeah, to a degree, I, I think um, the weirdest thing with magic is, I find is that it never behaves the way you want it to like the result never behaves the way you want it to so like I, I, for a long time I was trying to I became obsessed with the kind of Praetor human kind of stuff like trying to kind of contact others you know beings yeah. whatever and uh I sort of was seen a lot of rituals around that kind of um that kind of work but it had no results at all and for a while, I hadn't given up, but I was still doing one ritual um, every day, the lesser banishing, lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, which is just like cleaning mm -hmm. house spiritually each day kind of thing. And, you know, I just kind of got into the habit of doing it. I do my TM, I do transcendental meditation for like 20 minutes, and then I do the lesser banishing ritual. And uh, I remember like that I got the biggest result from. And that's the weirdest thing because it's like the most basic, like, you know, it's what you, it's the first thing you do really. It's the first kind of regular practice you do but that was the thing that gave me the biggest praetor human kind of experience and i was like what the fuck's going on so it's almost like again it's that trickstery kind of thing where it sort of appears when you least expect it to and yeah i just find it yeah i find it really i mean that really it was when th that experience happened that's when i kind of started to do sitting now a lot more of a sudden because i was like oh, okay right that's kind of because i was starting to lose sort of faith in it a little bit and then it but it's like it kind of went nope there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, yeah. Really, and I find that happens a lot. Yeah. Well, so so like that's why I think Dan is like a, a key component of whatever the t tapestry or like it t in my mind, right? This is my own personal interpretation, and kind of like Penny Royal is my attempt to express what what I think is is the thing or or draw a picture of it, right? But mm -hmm. like 
I think that we have discovered and are interacting with an information network of sorts, like an information structure, you know, and, and a lot of the stuff in penny world, you know, cybernetics, second order cybernetics became sort of like a, 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 a really good way for us, you know, to look at some of this stuff, to understand what, what was happening. Right. And I, and I think it speaks a lot to, to, or it helps me at least understand magic a little bit, you know, in terms of like feedback mm-hmm. and, and things like that and ritualism. And so like, um, but I, I really felt like we were interacting with this, this, it's a structure of sort of, I say information structure, but it just seems that, that, that it is connected in some way. But Dan kept popping up. He still keeps popping up. You know, he still is like a node in all of it, right? You, you'll, you'll just find Dan connecting in different ways to different, different parts of it. But, uh, Late in the first season, you know, after I was uh, looking at all this stuff, I'd found the stuff about the bait cabal um, in the 1970s coming down from uh, Cincinnati to, to this area, right, to the Daniel Boone National Forest doing these rituals. So I was digging into all the newspaper archives here, the old, old stuff, and at that during that time period right and i and there's a facility here that's called oakwood and people have had all kinds of like uh ghost experiences there and stuff and it's an active um sort of uh it's like a mental health facility right um and 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 more so now right but back in 1973 is when it was founded right and so like the place was supposed to have been built in the desert out west i found out and the design of the buildings, the buildings are supposed to be built halfway down in the ground, right? Because they were going to be on a sort of a, a wind swept desert area. So the winds could get high, right? So the buildings were supposed to be recessed into the earth. Well, when they ended up moving the project from out West to Kentucky, they kept the design, right? So the buildings are, are built down into the ground. They're built in this really strange, it looks like if you look for, for, at Google Maps, right, uh, or Google Earth, and look at this from above, it looks like a weird symbol, right? The way they built the buildings. And they hired a very famous artist who designed many of the corporate logos in America, like for some of the biggest uh, car companies and brands. He's from Somerset. And they hired him, and he's like a very eccentric guy. So he was involved in the construction of the place. So they built the place in 1973. And at the time you can find all these newspaper articles about this. And, and that's the thing too, like a lot of the stuff that I, that I talk about in payroll, I mean, it's all in, you can find the newspapers, you know, it sounds mm. outlandish, right? It sounds crazy, but it's like right there it is, man. Like people were writing about it. People believe this, you know, it's like, there's no need to make anything up because strangely it's it's all there but it's like the weirdest thing is that it's all there on top of each other right from all these Mm. different things but uh but in 73 uh nbc did a special about this place because it was going to be this experimental mental health facility uh a lot of veterans were coming back from vietnam and uh the the uh, psychiatric uh treatment sort of industry was seen as, as if it was in shambles right and so this facility was going to show that they've they've turned you know turned course you know cor- course corrected in the right way and it was going to be a non institutional mental health facility with these cottages right so six weeks after the place opens up there's this anonymous letter that's sent to the governor of Kentucky the head of the state police the mayor here the sheriff here alleging that there's a witch cult right performing magic. In the facility, in the tunnels beneath the facility that connect the tunnel or to connect the the cottages together, and I mean, so like there are all these newspapers, and they're literally talking about the witch cult, right? And that they were burning symbols into the backs of some of the residents at this place, right? And this is in '73, uh, and and this is exactly at the same time that the bait cabal was coming down here, and that there were these ritual, and not just the bait cabal. I found other groups that were not the bait cabal that were also in the, this area at the same time. Again, none of them were connected to Oakwood, right? The witch cult stuff that was happening there was unrelated. But uh, but there are t- all these newspaper articles. They end up firing everybody on the staff, and then they hire a new guy to come in to take over that the, as director. So that guy's son, uh, stepson, ends up 
I, I interview him, right? And I, I knew some of these stories about Oakwood and uh, I didn't know that he had a relationship to Oakwood, you know? So I, I bring this up and he's like, oh yeah, my, I, I know all this stuff is true because I've seen the files, right? And he, he's like, I've seen, you know, my father was the director that took over. And I was like, holy shit. And so, uh, and he ended up, Rod Zimmerman, who's who's in the first season, he ends up being connected in a, a lot of weird ways to a, a lot of different stories. And he, again, like Dan, is sort of like a node in the whole network of things. But uh, but he, he and I are talking. He tells me that there was a cottage there, that most of the, the people that were in the facility uh, were were sort of uh, uh, low functioning. Right. And that there was a, a, a cottage of, of ultra high functioning savants. Right. Of, of just like these seven kids. And. I was like, well, that's, that's kind of weird. You know, he just brought it up. That was it. Right. That, then I, I thought well, that's a strange thing I've, I've never heard before. So I'm talking to Dan. Right. And we're talking about, um, you know, talking about pan and I was talking about the Oakwood. Uh, so the Oak King and the Holly King, right. The cycle of, of, of sort of the killing of the King and, and that whole ritual. Right. Talking about it in the context of like, the killing of JFK, right? <laughs> and some of the downer stuff. So I was telling Dan about it and he was drawing a correlation between the Oak King and Pan, right? And we, we were, that was sort of the discussion that we were having. And he's like, well, I've got a, cause I said the Oakwood, you know, it, it's, it's crazy that there's Oakwood here, all these Oak things and, and Pan. And he's like, well, I've got an Oakwood story. Then he proceeds to tell me that he, was approached by one of the the caretakers at Oakwood and she wanted him to teach painting lessons to a group of the residents there. And he didn't want to do it. And he was like, I, you know, he, he doesn't drive. And she kept trying to get him to, to come and, and teach the lessons. So finally he acquiesces, right. And they send a car, they pick him up. He gets to Oakwood and, um, and she, she had told him, she said, there are these these residents there and this is what was so crazy like he starts to tell me this and i'm like he's going to talk about the savants right and he tells me that like she she said and i've confirmed this since right that th that they were there that there was a group of like seven children and that they were she believed that they were inhabited by non-human she thought you know et intelligences right and that they were trying to save humanity. She tells Dan this, right? Mm -hmm. And he thinks, she, and this is, he's like, this was 1979, or, or this was, yeah, this was 79 when he had his interaction with him, uh, and that everybody was taking acid, right, here in town. And he was like, she's just, mm -hmm. he was like, there was some really good Egyptian eyed, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just thought she was she was high, right? And uh, and but she told him the story, and I'm like, what the fuck, you know? So he they send a car, they take him over there. He gets to Oakwood. She's not there. There's another caretaker. They take him all the way in the back, and that and that's what Rod had told me too. He's like, it was a cottage located all the way in the back, away from everybody, everyone else. Mm -hmm. And he goes out there, and he said, as he approached, all of the there were these kids, and they were in the grass eating popcorn out of the grass like they were horses, right? And he was like, and Nathan, that's the last thing I remember, right? <laughs> and I was like, what? He was like, I, I, and, and it was weird. And you can hear it in the recording. The recording is like the actual recording of the conversation because right? we were talking about the, the pan stuff. And then it was like we veered into this. And I swear to God, man, my heart was racing because I couldn't believe he was talking about it. You know, after I had talked to this other guy about the savant stuff, and, and so he tells me that he doesn't know what happened. The next thing he remembers, and, and that's Dan's work is about memory. Like a lot of his art is about memory mm -hmm. palaces, right? And some of this, those ideas. And, and he was like, and he prides himself on his memory. And he was like, I, I actually haven't thought about this in, you know, 40 years. And he was like, I don't know what happened. He said, the next memory I have is the, them driving me back to my farm three hours later. And dropping me off. And he was like, as, and so, I, you know, I'm pressing him like, you don't remember anything from this interaction with these, these savants. Right. And he was like, nothing. Right. He said, but that afternoon was the afternoon that he was walking around on in Dandelion. And he received what he says was the inspiration 
for the secret commonwealth, the fawn, all of those works of art that ended up following in the next two decades, right? All he said came from that afternoon that he now can't remember what happened when he met those, that group. Right. So like, to me, it's strange that, that, and that group was, was existent here from uh, the, the cottage with the savants from 73 to 81. And like, that's exactly the time that you've got the bait cabal coming down here, trying to like close a portal from that. They believe there are these non-human intelligences. You've got other groups. And I was like, just, that's so strange. Like it all probably isn't connected, but it's strange that it's connected because it's in the same place. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like the place is the common, you know, factor in all of these things. And it's like, is the place producing that effect or are the people, you know, feeding it into the place? Um, but I don't know, man. It's just like, that's strange. You know, it's like, was, is that what set the, set this all in motion? Was it that group, right? What was well, like, how did the group come to be inhabited by those intelligences, right? Did, did the bait cabal or one of these other groups perform a ritual that somehow un had unintended consequences, which allowed mm -hmm. these intelligences to, to sort of ride these children? I don't know, man. I mean, <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've, always been interested in this um it's, it's this thing that seems to happen to certain people where they they receive um some kind of information download so like you can i mean philip k dick's a classic example of that yeah. you know the pink laser um robert yeah. anton wilson with the serious stuff yeah you've got uh crowley you could say he had that same experience yeah. with uh iwas yeah um leary you know <laughs> there's all right. these people like Star even C david ike yeah David Icke had suddenly had this experience where he thought he was Jesus Christ and was receiving all of this information. But you know, obviously, and people seem to use it in totally different ways. And I, I've often wondered if your friend Dan had a some sort of experience like that, where he was suddenly had a download of information and he, he just interpreted it through creative, you know, um, uh, endeavors. Yeah, possibly. and it's like, was Dan already weird or was this the, was this the beginning of the weirdness? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, cause it's like, he is, uh, it's like some people are radioactive in a way, right. That, that it's, it, and if you look at, uh, Robert Anton Wilson or Carrie Thornley, right. Mm -hmm. There are some of these people that are sort of like, uh, strange attractors or like, str you know what I mean? Like they're, they're, they're like, shit just seems to connect off of them and and they seem to be producing weirdness all the time right it's like is it because of this download that's that's caused that effect i don't know yeah it's interesting so i've got the, the other person i wanted to talk to you about that i found fascinating was mr x yeah um yeah um could you tell us a bit about mr x and yeah. kind of how that kind of became a part of the podcast well, that, again, you know, that was another one of those strange things where it was like, how is this even fucking possible? Right. Uh, so, uh, and it, this is Somerset, Kentucky, right. And I think it's weird also, that, you know, there is, uh, a power in names, right. And naming. And, and I do think that there are, uh, uh, you know, that whole idea of like mystical toponymy and that, that, that the names of places affect the places, the fact that this is Somerset, and it's named after Somerset, New Jersey, which was founded by people from Somerset, England, right? There's this weird, uh, you know, line of, of strange. And, and Somerset's a weird place generally. I mean, Somerset's near like places like Glastonbury and, you know, yeah. um, and I have my own history of it. Every Christmas we go to Somerset um, and it's a strange place. It, it's really weird. But anyway, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I just wonder, it's like Glastonbury tour, you know, and all that stuff. So yeah. So it's like, and, and see some things I've found now, about this place relate back to Glastonbury tour, right? It's, it's weird, you know, but, but I've always wondered about that, but ultimately in Somerset's like a very rural place, uh, out, you know, on the edge of the Daniel Boone national forest, like in the middle of nowhere, not, not nowhere, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, there's a big lake here, but it's, it's a very rural area, not a place that you would find what, what you would think you would find a lot of, of people connected to larger events. And, and so, so that was sort of what happened was that we, uh, there was, <laughs> There was a woman who had, uh, I, I had heard all these stories about cults being here, like a strange cult. And it ended up not being, it's not true. There's no cult here, but there were a bunch of different stories in the local folklore that had all like come together and it produced this story. And that's kind of like 
penny roll is partly about unraveling that, but even finding weirder things. Right. And, uh, uh, I'd interviewed this woman who had had these, uh, ritual abuse. She had ritual abuse claims, Pamela. And, and they were very, I mean, like they're very shocking. And, and, and that was probably one of the hardest interviews that I did because it's such sensitive subject matter. Right. And absolutely something happened to her. Um, you know, I don't know if it was exactly what, if, if her interpretation of events were different than, you know, but she definitely had suffered abuse. Right. But and that's often the case though with people when they've suffered. I mean, we saw this a lot with the satanic panic where mm -hmm. a lot of people projected a kind of satanic storyline over the, yes. you know, to kind of, cause it helps them. I, I've read a lot about this. It kind of helps them kind of rationalize what happened to them in their mind by kind of assigning it to a, a kind of sinister group kind of thing, yeah. doesn't it? it yeah. yeah. And, 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 and she had, you know, claims about, devils and and sort of like serpent people and some stuff you know what i mean it was it was some sacrifice of children and stuff and yeah yeah you know but but ultimately uh, uh i was like you know uh, it, and, the, and when she recovered the memories it was 1992 so it was definitely like in that range of the satanic mm -hmm. panic and it yeah, was the, yeah. there were other women in this town that had had s similar claims they mm -hmm. all were seeing the same psychiatrist that was using a, a special type of shock therapy to help them unlock memories. Right. So I, I've never gone super deep into that, but that's a, that's a part of this too. Anyway, but she, she mentioned this, uh, I, we had asked her finally, you know, I interviewed her, we were talking and I was like, you know, where did this happen? Right. Like where, like where in, in this County d d do you think this happened? And she said the Mount victory mine. Right. And I'm like, all right. And she said there was a guy that, that called himself the great is, Right. And yeah, yeah, he yeah. was this little, the bald headed guy, he was leader of the cult and, and he spoke, spoke in these and thou's right. And was very like culty, religious, you know, Christian cult kind of stuff. But, uh, as soon as you Google like, uh, the Mount victory mine, right. You, f it, what pops up is New York times articles about a guy named Alexander Guterma and the New York times refers to him as Mr. X because no one knew where this guy came from. He like shows up in the U S in like 1953 and ends up uh, becoming vastly wealthy. And he commits the largest stock fraud in U S history, right? By 1959. Um, he's involved in the overthrow of the Dominican Republic uh, and charged with all kinds of stuff by the government um, gets convicted. He, he's named as a co-conspirator in the JFK assassination, right? And tied through the Morn show. There's a whole big, weird JFK assassination connection to Somerset, Kentucky, right? Through him, through the Warren Commission. It, that was, a, again, another strange aspect of it all. But this Mr. X, right, that did all these crazy things, who they also think might be uh, the reason that there's nothing known about him is that he was either a CIA agent or was an abware agent who was brought over to the United States uh, through uh, Galen's program, right? There was paperclip, right? But then there was the Galen program where they brought over intelligence agents, right? And he was, he was also arrested in Hawaii as a foreign operative working at a radio station, right <laughs> Un under the name sandy mcsand right it's just it's, it's just this it's a great name <laughs> right sandy McSand. uh and, and it's in you know I've, I've i ended up filing FOIA requests and got it was just i think there were 1200 pages of documents on this guy from the fbi and they mentioned the sandy mcsand they all this stuff and that that by itself you could do i could do a whole podcast that was just you know alexander guterma but the reason when you Google Mount Victory coal mine, it, he pops up is that in 1975, he moved his entire financial empire, right, to Somerset, Kentucky, and bought the Mount Victory coal mine, right? And, and, and so this woman is telling me that there was an international cult operating out of the Mount Victory mine in the mid 70s. And then we find that this guy who is this international man of mystery bought that mine. Right. And he, and this was what was crazy too, man. Again, this is like why I'm like, there's something to all this because it's like the mine was, was, was owned by this local attorney um, who was just reviled. Right. And, uh, uh, and they wrote a book about him called uh, dark and bloody ground. Right. And then his business partner, 
was uh, fucking Vice President Spiro Wagner. So like the Vice President of the United States with this uh, attorney in Somerset owned this mine and this Mr. X guy bought the mine from them, right? And then Spiro Agnew ends up, I mean, if you look all this stuff up, he ends up being almost charged with tax fraud over this mine in Somerset, Kentucky, right? And Mm -hmm. that guy is here from 1975 to 1977 and then mysteriously dies in a plane crash after he flies from Somerset to New York City, right? And then the government takes the mine back. And it's on government land. The United States government owns this and it's inside the Daniel Boone National Forest. And it's and it's it's exactly when you look at the maps of the Kentucky anomaly, it's exactly above it. And the area that Nemo was coming to the Baker Ball is exactly that area. And I ended up interviewing all these people uh, that live in that area of like Mount Victory and White Lily and they had they remembered this group coming down from Cincinnati. They were it's composed of people from Cincinnati and New York, right? And mm-hmm. they were doing these rituals out there, and they were staying in a structure uh, that was referred to as the Beehive, and it was like a ritualistic building with all these like strange designs, and it's still here. I had a, I hired a guy, and he flew a, a you know a drone over the the structure still here and it's super strange man you know and it's like right there you know just a couple miles from where this mine is and it's like again it's like what are the odds that that someone like Alexander Katerma would show up in the same place where all of this stuff is happening right but I don't think there is any connect. I don't. He wasn't connected to a cult, right? He wasn't connected mm-hmm. to any of this stuff. But it's strange that he was drawn to that place, right? And uh, and then that was the thing too. So it's like after after I found him, you know, I was like, there's no way we could possibly find anybody else here in in Somerset stranger than that. You know, this guy's involved in all these world events. And then we in the second season, I cover the whole Chuck Hayes stuff. Right. And it ends up, there's a dude with these CIA allegations that ties into Danny Castlo or Castellero and the promise software and all kinds of weird shows. It was like another strange figure that was tied into international events here in the same County. Right. You know, it's like, why are all these people being drawn to this same place? Mm, yeah it's interesting, isn't it? Um, one thing, another thing you kind of touch on in season two, and it's something we've, danced around on the show a little bit but it might be cool to have a quick conversation about um james shelby downard because there's there's a there's you i mean you kind of go into him quite a bit don't you in season two Um, yeah um uh, there was you know downard ended up um he he's a strange figure i think he's you know in terms of like the what i would say the the non QAnon legit (laughs) conspiracy community you know like people that were really researching JFK assassinations, you have, you know, I feel like there's the the actual body of researchers into things that might be called conspiracies, but it's like conspiracy with theory, right? Michael Hughes in the mm. second season talks about that. Um, but then there's a lot of like conspiracy without theory, and that's the mm. crazy, you know, stuff. Oh, yeah, on- I mean, we th- we talk about that a lot on the show. Like, there was this kind of point where, like, if you were into conspiracy, like. I'm old enough to remember when conspiracy theories were kind of a subculture, you know, they, they, it was like a, it was a very left wing thing as well. So it was like very yeah. left wing, very anti-government, but at the same time you were researching, I mean, even Alex Jones used to be like that to yeah, a degree yeah, at one point, yeah. like in the early days, he was kind of anti-government, anti, anti, you know, conservatism, all this kind of stuff. But I think what happened was nine 11 happened and all of a sudden people kind of used conspiracy theory as a as an excuse to kind of it was almost like an evangelical response wasn't it it was it was interesting yeah to watch yeah. and then QAnon's the kind of you know the the grand kind of conspiracy of all of that stuff where it's all just pulled from other conspiracy theories if you yeah. look at it closely it's it's a collection of conspiracy theories that had already happened that have just been digested into one kind of thing it's kind of it's interesting but yeah sorry that was a bit of a side rant there but yeah, no, no i mean I, I totally agree and, and, and like i think mm. that what you said too about the fact that it was like a lot of anti-government left lean left leaning mm-hmm. anti-government sort of ideas you can't trust the government the government's lying to us about ufos but you know a lot of right-wing groups infiltrated those groups oh yeah 
and and like right wing groups, you know, like the John Birch Society and some of those, you know, mm-hmm. Willis Cardo's. And then group. people like William Cooper was another one. Yeah. I mean, he was quite he yeah. was very libertarian and conservative, yeah. and he's kind of like a proto Alex Jones, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, those are there were a lot of like right wing anti government groups. It was easy to say, hey, you don't trust the government, neither do we. And I think yeah, there's yeah. a lot of inf- infiltration by the sort of right wing extremists uh, in those groups, but. Um, but yeah, so but the grand old man of a lot of this stuff, I think, comes from like James Shelby Downard, right? In the nineteen mm-hmm. you know, uh, the King Kill thirty three stuff that came out through you know Feral House, and uh, you know, there's the Jim Brandon who was William Grimstead, but a, a lot of these guys that were with Downard, it turns out, were not you know, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, you know, uh, affiliated with Nazi leaning elements, right? I'm not saying they're Nazis, you know. No, no one sue me, you know, but I'm just saying <laughs> there were some extremist views uh, circling around mm-hmm. Downard. I just think that's that's one of the the things that kind of popped out about that. But but Downard himself legitimately, uh, you know, you've got Adam Gorightly uh, is a huge uh, uh, researcher into Downard, obviously it, it just published the, the uh, second sort of biography on it. Um, and then you've got Richard Spence, you know, uh, who's researched this stuff, uh, you know, Paranoid Magazine. I think he, he's probably the, the preeminent expert on everything web Downard related. I think he was probably one of the first to, to put me on Downard, right, in terms of talking about place and, and the mystery of place and this whole idea of mystical to- toponymy, right? So, so I think Spence pushed us in that direction. But then when we looked into Downard, it's like he went to college 20 minutes north of Somerset. Right. He was in Cincinnati. You know, there's all these connections to Cincinnati. He ends up in St. Petersburg. But then there's a there are all these weird connections that draw down or into Somerset and into this, you know, just oh, the wider narrative of the stuff we were looking at, especially with the JFK assassination stuff. And uh, and yeah, man, we just went down that rabbit hole. And I started looking for documents, ended up finding some rare documents, the the um, belligerent rabbit society uh, letter, which kind of came out of our investigation. And Adam and I, you know, correspond, you know, a lot about about Downard and about that mystery. But I think you know, Downard's just another one of those people like Carrie Thornley or Dan Dutton. You know what I mean? That, that's that's tied into a lot of stuff and and is like a weird sort of node and I th- he's a good lens to look at the phenomena through you know this mm-hmm. kind of like how people become you know th- th- as they would say synchro mystically you know connected to a lot of events and places right and uh, yeah i just it, a lot of a lot but you know all that to say also that downard was a, a, a pretty bigoted racist mm-hmm. person if you read his writings it's uh, always a downer isn't it it's like you, you find these like really fascinating people and they're always there's always something that kind of i mean even crowley had some pretty yeah. bad yeah. you know politics and yeah it's kind of you just think ah oh, damn it like, i really want to like these guys <laughs> but Dude, yeah yeah but, you know that's the uh, that's just it's like what is it what is it they say kill all your kill all your idols you know what i mean like <laughs> you know it's yeah. like, you know, you're just going to find all these, you know, like the one thing too, that we found out through all the research into Downard. Uh, and we talked about a little bit in the second season, you know, Jack Kerouac, you know, that really was the, the genesis of the beatnik generation and this whole sort of, uh, you know, think of like hitchhiking America and the, uh, and, and it just fed the hit, that idea of like the hippie movement and everything. Um, he turns out to be involved in the same group of people with Downard that were that were basically right wing extremists, right? That it, like I pretty much we, which I don't want to be sued by the Kerouac estate, but there are other writers and researchers, you know, that we found that have published books that who have been sued by the estate that allege that Kerouac was involved with some of these groups and and was always a sort of a a, a racist right like right wing extremist uh but he's not remembered for that right he's all the, he's this this idol of american individuality right and and i just think that's there's a lot of these things that it's like that's the myth of the man but the real man was like a pretty shitty fucking human you know like mm. yeah it sucks it sucks 
One thing in the Hellier second series, there's a really interesting part in that where Greg is talking to the woman on the phone and she's recounting the kind of experiences she's had. Is it in Somerset? I think it yeah, is, isn't it? Yeah, she, yeah, 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 yes. So yeah, how she, was, that... she was in jail here, you know, that's the... Yeah. the, the, the and, and the cabin too, you know, like that whole story too, like the the where there's an elevator that goes down into the cave and stuff. They mentioned mm. all that stuff. That is real. I mean, that's a real place we found. I mean, mm. we know the people that own the cabin and, and that it was used for, a, it's like a medical lift. They were using mm. it for convalescence. The woman that lived there had a lung disorder and like that area has tons and tons of the huge cave systems. And there was a cave underneath that cabin. And, and so like th- that woman who was, was calling Greg, right. Amy, uh, the what she's telling them about some of that stuff is real. Like, I mean, that's you know, mm. I think she was having sort of drug induced freak out, you know. Mm. But have you encountered her at all? Have you kind of, you know, do have you identified who she is? Yeah, I know who she is. Yeah, yeah, for yeah, yeah, hundred mm. percent. We 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 figured out who she was just like two days after the show came out. And we were like, okay, like because I didn't know any, you know. At, at the time that they'd come down here, he shared with me that someone had contacted him. He wouldn't tell me what her name was, right? He kind of shared the content of, and that was what was weird too. You know, at that point I was like, there's no cult here. You know, it's mm-hmm. just this sort of conflation of a few different uh, pieces of local folklore. And then I told him all the stuff that I had researched and found. And then he told me about the con those emails from that, the Amy character. And I, then I was kind of, he was, they were freaked out and we were freaked out. Cause I was like, well, what if there really is something right again, there's not, but it's like, I definitely think that like, I know who she is and there's a off, like once we get off here, I'll tell you something that, that mm-hmm. I can't really talk about that, that connects to a lot of this stuff personally, but, um, but she's a real person and all that stuff. But uh, I think that, that they again were interacting with, like what she was experiencing and thinking was here is a part of an older tradition that's embedded here. Right. Mm. So I, I, just the same way that like Pamela, who we interviewed is sort of seeing events in a certain way. I think that possibly because of drugs and other things that they had interacted with something that fed sort of imagery and, and symbols and things into to, to her mind in a sense. Right. Uh, that may be through drugs and sort of being in an altered state that they, that they interacted with some of this. Cause, cause the, again, where all of that stuff is happening, right. And all of this is taking place and she's saying that's happening. And, and the hell like that hellier crew where they were at is the, where the Mount victory mine is right. Mm-hmm. Is atop the peak of the Kentucky anomaly, right. That area exactly is where all of this stuff is playing out, you know? I have this kind of weird theory that I think what happens is a lot of people try and look at when they, I think that there are groups around that exist. Um, and I, I've bumped into one of them <laughs> and I don't think they have anything to do with, um, with ceremonial magic as we know it. So I, I think whenever people think of like the occult, they immediately go to Crowley or to the golden dawn or all these kind of well-established kind of um, magical groups, essentially. And I have this theory that there's a whole other set of groups that are also practicing a form of magic, but it's not the it's not the magic we know through that lens. And possibly there's like a, yeah, I think that that's possibly what's happening. I think there's all these groups that have managed to remain secret um, that we don't know anything about, you know, not in the sense of like, you know, there's not books, the like wiser antiquarian or wiser rather aren't putting out... Um, books about them and Llewellyn aren't putting books about them out, but they've been around for a very long time. Um, and, and I think one of the things, my theory is that one of the the things that kind of, kind of spoiled that a little bit almost was the satanic panic um, evangelical kind of movement that kind of dubbed everything that they didn't know as Satanism, <laughs> if that makes sense. So it's almost like, we, whenever you think of these groups, you immediately, because of the satanic panic, you immediately label them as a Satanist group, or you know, or the general populace would label them as a Satanist group. And I wonder if there's maybe we're going to start finding who these groups are because more and more people, like I think, perhaps these groups are in Penny Royal, and perhaps there's this group that we've 
um, bumped into down down here, which we'll be talking about, you know, at a later date. But um, yeah, I, I wonder if the, these groups do exist and that there's something um, that we just don't understand yet, and we're starting to bump into them now. Maybe we're going to be dragging them out into the daylight a bit more. If that makes uh, sense. Yeah. So so. Uh, <laughs> hundred percent man i'm like yes i like i don't think there's a cult here but uh that's what the third season is really the continuation of the of, of the story that's kind of unfolded in the first two seasons but like what i ended up finding and and really what we explored and i'm tr- what i try to unpack is that we did find an older tradition here right it's not a cult there's no like you know people in town aren't in it's not like the fucking wicker man right you know what i mean mm-hmm. but like something there is an older tradition and I, I think what we found involves old welsh magic like i uh, mm-hmm. you know there's like everything hints at that but like it's just i don't know man it's a hundred percent something a, an older tradition that has existed in these communities, which might not even be viewed as magic, right? Mm-hmm. By the communities themselves exist. And like that's, we have, we have bumped up against it. I don't know what it is. It's, it's one of those things where it's like, it's so old that I don't even know if they know what the name of it is. Right. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's sort of like, you know, like I was saying with the secret country when they were going around you know, in England, the couple was in the 1970s collecting this folklore. No one really knew where the those those traditions came from, right? There's even like the there's a bunch of traditions that are mentioned in the secret country that I found here in that area where White Lily is and the mine is, right? That the groups were st- are still were at least in the 1960s and 70s were still practicing pagan rituals as part of the church. And it's really strange, like direct connection st- some stuff I've never, ever even heard of. And it was like, well, yeah, that was just part of the church's tradition out there in White Lily. And it's like, mm-hmm. this is like old pagan traditions that mm-hmm. they can't even name. Like, how did it end up here? Right. Mm-hmm. And I, that's what I, I think, you're, yeah, I think like, that's what I've been trying to figure out. I was like, what, it, like who, what is the, it is a group that's not in the mm-hmm. line. It is a tradition that people don't know about. It's like, I, I don't know, man. It's, but I definitely think that that's feeding into everything that we've found, right? Everything that, mm-hmm. that we've uncovered and continue to uncover, I think traces back to that, that older, older tradition, you know? Yeah. And it's interesting how that older stuff seems to be, and that we did this thing, the uh, Polaria interview recently, and that's all about this kind of older tradition, this kind of, mystic polar tradition i think they called it um and then i've been looking into this group because a lot of their symbology seems to be old again as well and it seems it almost feels like all this stuff's starting to bubble up a little bit at the moment and it's kind of fascinating to yeah to you know investigate it (laughs) it's it's really interesting but anyway so let us know where people can find you online what's the what's the best way to interact with you uh, so uh, we're on, you know, Twitter or X, whatever, you know, Facebook. Uh, definitely have a Patreon, uh, the Liminal Lodge. Uh, highly encourage people to check it out. It has all of our research, like literally as we're making uh, the show and, and everything we're researching, we're talking about it. Um, and so like there's tons of I think, uh, hours and hours and hours of extended audio that weren't in the first and second seasons where I've included like the whole interviews with people that are really fantastic. Just couldn't put it all in there. Uh, so you can check us out on Patreon, Facebook, you know, all Spotify, Apple, you know, podcasts, every, all the major platforms we're on there. Um, so yeah, you can check us out. And, and after uh, uh, the season three of Penny Roll comes out at the first part of next year, uh, I've got another podcast that'll be coming out. It's called hidden in the herd. Uh, that involves uh, the cattle mutilations in the 1970s that oh, wow. we've done a bunch of research into. They all came it, it came out of the Penny Royal research, and it involves a lot of right wing extremist esotericists and uh, mm-hmm. cattle mutilations. So, so sort of like you know a continuation of the Penny Royal research will be will be that later next year too. So, but yeah, check us out all that stuff. You follow us on Facebook or follow us on uh, Twitter. Join the Patreon, and you'll you'll learn about all that stuff. So. 
Excellent. And um, the, I guess the big question people are going to ask him is when can we expect to see season three? Uh, I was shooting for the end of January. It may be a little bit later. It may be around uh, the the spring. I, 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 was, I was like, I could release it on the spring equinox. <laughs> right? yeah, you know, yeah, spring be- rights, you know, so, but it'll be, the first, <laughs> it'll be the first part next year, but probably uh, sometime between January and March, I'll, I'll probably roll it out. So, yeah. Are you going to do the thing where you bring it all out in one batch again or we still i think we're gonna it's still gonna be probably weekly episodes um but that's the thing too is like i i would have had everything done except i kept finding new stuff (laughs) that's always the problem (laughs) yeah i had to interview all kinds of new people to to in the show you know because it's new things have unfolded and i've found new things and just it's it's that's been the journey i guess for me that's like the 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 funnest part or the Mm. the most enjoyable part right most fulfilling part is that you know, just having it continue, it just continues to unfold like a flower. You know what I mean? It just opens up and there's all of these things and, and you just keep chasing it down all these different rabbit holes. And I don't know. That's the great thing about all these kinds of mysteries. You know, it's, it's, it's yeah, yeah. It's a very personal journey, I guess, you know, your own sort mm-hmm. of um, your thing. So yeah, I, I love it though. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us and we'll have to have you back on because uh, there's lots of stuff to talk about. Oh, dude. So, and dude, thank you so much for having me on here. This, no, this was awesome. Much. This was fantastic. So, awesome.